But one thing that you will not find on my CV, and, and I apologize for those that have sat through three community forums, because I think, or three forums, you've heard this story before. The one thing you won't find on my CV is that I'm a first generation college student. Not only am I a first generation college student, I'm a first generation high school graduate. Now, my parents were born at a time, uh, they were older when I was born, but they were born at a time where it was not uncommon for someone to go into high school, leave high school before ever graduating so that they could help the family out financially. But the one thing they were absolutely committed to was that their only child would have the opportunity they never had, and that's to get that college degree. Now, they didn't know what that was going to look like. They, again, they had never graduated high school, but they were committed to me getting the college degree. I would never have made it in college had I not had some very good mentors who took the time to work with me, help me out, faculty and staff. The reason I say that is because never underestimate those of you who are faculty and staff who work at this college or you're even a community member who mentors a student, never underestimate the impact you have on their lives. Uh, there are hundreds of 18-year-old Ted Lewis's running around out there that don't know what they're doing or how to get there without your help will never succeed in college. So I want to thank you for doing that. Now, I did go on and I was successful. I, I got my bachelor's degree, got my master's degree, went on and got my doctorate. The quick story is I was getting my master's degree. I, my, my degree's in political science. And don't ask me to explain political science because I'm not sure if there's a science in politics, but uh, nonetheless, that, that's what my degree was in. Um, when I was in graduate school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just simply knew I loved political science. So I had a meeting set up with the department chair of political science at the University of North Texas, where I graduated from. And as I was supposed to meet with him at 8 o'clock at his office that morning, he was running late. He didn't come in until about 8.05. And I'm sitting there patiently waiting for him. And he came in very hurriedly and said, you're Mr. Lewis. I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, have you ever taught, thought about teaching political science? And I, I said, no, I haven't. And he said, would you like to teach political science? I said, yeah, I think I might enjoy that. He said, good. Here's your books. Class started five minutes ago. Down the hall, you're in 122. That's a true story. Now, when I got down there, I realized it took me a while. That was my passion. That's exactly what I wanted to do. But the reason I also tell that story, and I mentioned this earlier today, is because when we hire our faculty, we hire them because they're knowledgeable in their material. I was if I was a 22 year old, but we hire them because of that, but we don't always give them the tools to be successful. I think as administrators, it's critically important that we give our employees the tools to succeed in what they do. Well, anyway, I went on, I, I got my master's degree. I, I, I taught uh, political science at the college level for the next roughly 28 years. Courses I taught were often called high impact classes. Uh, courses that engage the students, involve them, where they were talking about service learning, learning communities, honors courses, study abroad courses, technology enhanced courses. Courses that were developed specifically to help the student, engage the student, and help them be successful. Now, one of the programs that I was very privileged to be chair of was Learning Communities. And I've asked this before. How many of y'all are familiar with Learning Communities? Okay, a couple of folks. Learning Communities are taking different disciplines to faculty members and integrating those disciplines along a common question or a bigger question. Well, I was asked to be the director of that Learning Communities program at Collin College, just north of Dallas. We were very successful in that we won the National Bellwether Award uh, for student engagement. Based on that, I was hired by the uh, uh, Washington Evergreen State College in Washington to be part of their National Learning Communities Dissemination Project, where I would go around the country and help colleges start learning communities programs. Still very much committed, in fact, love the classroom. I was down in the Houston area, and I was helping a group from what was then called North Harris Montgomery Community College District. And I met a woman who was going to be their founding president, a woman was named Diane Troyer. We engaged, we talked, and then over the next few weeks, I saw her at different things that I was leading, uh, conferences or meetings about learning communities. And she came up to me and asked me, have you ever thought about being a dean? Uh, now let me tell you, uh, how, how many of y'all are faculty members? Raise your hand if you're faculty. Okay, there's not that many faculty, okay. I don't know how many academic administrators ever started out saying, I want to be an administrator. 
uh, we all became faculty members because we loved the classroom. We loved engaging faculty. I was very much the same way. At that point, it was really kind of a, a really come to reality time for me. Uh, my wife, by the way, I'm negative, not introducing my wife. My wife, Catherine's in the back of the room. Um, Catherine and I talked it over. I, I didn't want to leave the classroom. I, I loved the classroom. I had a passion for the classroom. But Catherine and I talked it over, and uh, we, we talked about, you know, why do you want to be a faculty member? Well, because I love students. I love engaging students, making a difference in their lives. I love working with other faculty members. Well, I can make a difference of a couple of hundred, maybe 300 students every semester as a faculty member, as a department chair, but I could perhaps make a more profound difference in a thousand lives or more than that as a dean of a brand new college. So I did make the move. Uh, I became dean of instruction at Lone Star College, Cypher, moved to Houston, Texas, and uh, very privileged to start all of our programs from scratch, hire all of the faculty from scratch, develop all of the, all of the different processes from scratch. Now, as we grew, the president said, we need to have other deans as well. Uh, so she said, Ted, I want you to be the dean of science. Now, what part of political science do you not realize isn't really a science? Uh, I didn't get to be dean over social science. But what it did, she, her philosophy was, a dean is a dean is a dean. If you are an administrator, you can be an administrator, you can be a manager regardless of what your own discipline is. What it taught me, though, is to hire the right people and to trust their judgment. There's no way I could be an expert in physics. I had outstanding physicist, Dr. Tucci. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't be an expert in chemistry or biology. I also had our allied health programs. I also had our, our um, first responder programs. But again, to hire the right people and trust them, I thought it was a very important life lesson for me that I've taken with me. We continued to grow at Cypher College, and I stayed there for nine years. And then I had the opportunity to take the position as Vice President of Academic Affairs at Pellissippi State Community College in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I was there for six years. We developed another about a couple of dozen new programs, about 18 new programs all in all, uh, working with the community of what their needs were and how we could help engage them. We worked with the school district, and I created an early college high school on one of our campuses to where high school students had the opportunity to complete college at the time they graduated high school. And then about three years ago, I had the opportunity to move to Bluefield, West Virginia, where I became the provost and, and vice president of academic affairs at Bluefield State College. Uh, there, we worked with the community and I've had the opportunity to build, to build about two dozen new programs there as well. Bluefield State had had a declining enrollment over the last several years and the president came to me about a year and a half ago and said, Ted, I'd like for you to consider being the vice president of student affairs as well as the vice president of academic affairs. I need somebody that will be the chief enrollment officer and be more aggressive about our enrollment at the college. Now, a year and a half ago, we're talking basically January of 2020. I said, sure, no problem at all. We can grow enrollment January of 2020. Two months later, COVID hits, and all of a sudden, it changed everything. But I'm happy to say that by working with our faculty, our staff, our admissions counselors, we were able to create a very aggressive program to recruit students and also by working with faculty to retain students. That in this year when most colleges have declined enrollments, we actually grew enrollment in the fall, in the spring, and in the summer as well. So we've had some very good success with Bluefield State. So that's a little bit about my background. What questions can I answer that you may have? I've got some that people submitted, okay. and so I'm going to ask about, um, do you feel that in-person learning is important to students, and please expand on your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You asked me that question earlier, and I don't think you had to follow You said, is in-person learning Could you important? And I yes. said yes, and that was even my question. <laughs> uh, no, it absolutely is. Uh, one thing we've learned over the last year with COVID, having to go online, uh, first of all, we need to be able to develop the programs online to approximate that same experience a student would have face-to-face -face in a classroom. That, that's critically important. Um, but what we're learning, at least in my college, and I think we're learning at other colleges as well, is that students are hungry for the social experience of coming back, being in the classroom, engaging with their classmates. Uh, critically important. But COVID has also taught us there's a need for online learning, not just because of the pandemic and 
incredibly terrible pandemic, but a number of our students have lives that may not accommodate being able to take classes face to face. So it's incumbent upon us to approximate that experience that face-to-face -face and online learning as well. Making sure that our faculty have, have the tools to be effective to deliver classes online. Making sure that our processes are able to be done online. If a student, I mean, we'll take COVID out of the equation, if a student is in Nebraska and wants to take a course with us, and wants to take a course online, do we have our processes automated? where from the second the student expresses an interest in coming to North Art College, all the way to getting them enrolled, getting them the financial aid, making sure that they receive the checks, the payments, and they pay us as well. Do we have those processes automated? Do we have our tutoring automated, our counseling services? So while I'm a firm believer in face-to-face, -face, I, I don't think it can be completely replicated, I think at the same time, the reality of the situation and, and what's happening in America, not just because of this pandemic, but because of changing needs of our community, we need to be able to have a robust online experience for students as well. Thank you. What should North Art do differently to help solve the shortage of skilled workers for the businesses and industries in our area? I think the first thing we do is we talk to businesses and industries. I'm not implying you don't talk to businesses and industries, but find out what their needs are. You know, what are their needs for workers in our community? Uh, have some very robust advisory committees made up of members of the different businesses and industries to first of all help advise us in what we're offering. Curriculum advising, you know, what are we offering in terms of curriculum? Are the learning outcomes what the students need? Are they training on the latest and greatest state-of-the-art equipment to be able to go straight into industry upon employment? Are they showing the skills they need uh, along those lines? Are there internship opportunities those businesses and industries have available for the students? To try before you buy, so to speak, uh, to be able to test that student. And then if we're doing everything, everything we need to do, do those business and industries employ our students? Now, if we're talking workforce shortage out there, it's working with the business and industry. Are there ways that they can create incentives to be able to have more students? Uh, this question came up actually over breakfast this morning. Can some of the local employers right now who are offering incentives, you know, come to work for us, $300 signing bonus, $500. Is there a way they can use those to be able to have maybe some, some, some tuition vouchers? You know, we pay tuition, we pay benefits. You have employee assistance programs to be able to allow your current employees some time off during the time of the day in which those courses are offered. So I think it's a, it's a very firm partnership, or it needs to be a partnership, where you're working with business and industry. So that way, you can have the students from the industry and help give them the skills they need, and also at the same time, business can have some very effective employees coming from this college. Okay. Um. How would you go about selecting and implementing programs, I guess new programs, to be taught at North Art? Yeah, and, and, and it goes back very similar to your last question, as a matter of fact. Working with business and industry, I, I just uh, met with, with your board a few minutes ago, and we talked about that. Having those one-on-one -on -one meetings with business, having one-on-one -on -one meetings with industry, are we providing the skilled workers you need? Is there a gap? Is there a new program that we can help develop and deliver to help the economy of this region. Uh, those one-on-one -on -one conversations are very important. I talked a minute ago about having those advisory committee meetings, but also look at the data. Uh, Department of Labor puts out labor statistics where we look to see what are some needs in the different communities. Uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with EMSI, Economic Modeling Systems Incorporated, to where they drill down on that data and they can tell, help tell us uh, how many job openings are there in a particular area? What is the average age of the people who work there? What's the average salary? What is the estimated openings over the next 10 years, next five years? So I think when you start a new program, you don't simply start and say, hey, this is a good idea. Let's invest maybe a million dollars to create a new program. But to ask the community what's needed, to ask the employers what's needed, and then to follow up to make sure the data informs us that these are some programs that we can develop, we can deliver, and we can create a workforce. Okay. 
what would you see as your role as president with, uh, and what role should should the community and its various constituent groups have in the college operation? We'll say it one more time. Yeah, so how, what would you see as your role as president um, and how should the community and its various constituent groups have in the college operation? Ah, okay. Your president is the leader of this college. I mean, that, that's very clear. But as the leader of this college, it's making sure that that president has a very clear view of where he or she wants to take this college. Uh, I've been asked this actually a couple of times today in various forms. My vision is always going to be student success. Uh, getting students in, getting students out, and getting them meaningful jobs. What student success is going to do is be the economic driver of any community. Uh, and student success drives community success. Now, that's my vision, but to get there, we need to have all of the stakeholders involved. You heard me talk just a few minutes ago about how you bring in business industry and working with them to make sure, first of all, that we are training students in the programs that are needed, the meaningful jobs. When I talk about student success, my goodness, you cannot talk student success without talking the student services, without talking to faculty. What does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, and several of y'all have been forums that I've been speaking at throughout the day in terms of creating retention programs for students, creating some meaningful block schedules for students, some pathways for students. So I think it's important to invite everyone to the table, the stakeholders of how we get to where we want to on that. But again, I, I don't think that happens in a silo and certainly can't happen in isolation in the president's office. It needs to be a meaningful discussion through a very shared governance process. Okay. As the new president, everyone will know your name. How will you get to know the students, faculty, staff, and community members? Name tags. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm a firm believer in meeting people where they are. Uh, and, and some of y'all have already heard me say this today. That Everywhere I've gone as an administrator, the first couple of months, I get to know people. Uh, it's very easy for an administrator to say, hey, my door is always open, come in. But there's a power dynamic to that. It means that you're going to have to come into my space. I will call you if you work at this college, and then if you're in the community, expect a phone call from me that I want to come meet with you. It may be your place of employment, maybe, maybe faculty or staff in your office here. Uh, it may be over breakfast or over lunch, uh, and get to know you. It, that, to me, that's critically important. I've said before, one of the biggest mistakes that an administrator, a new administrator, to a very existing successful college, such as Northar, can make is come in and say, this is what we're going to do. This is my plan, without knowing who the people are. So I'm going to sit down with you in your office, and we're going to talk. Hey, what do you like? What, what, what are your passions? Uh, maybe what do you like to do for hobbies? What do you like to eat? Um, what are some things that you would like to see improved on at this college? And let me say in different places in which I've worked, we've created committees, we've created initiatives from that. Uh, at Bluefield State, when I first came to Bluefield State, I was doing that, and I kept getting a common theme with a lot of faculty members. You know, I wish that I had known how to do this when I first came to college. I wish that they had taught us how to do that. Well, I found the passion with several of those folks, several of the faculty members, and we created the New Faculty Academy. I created a, a, a committee to where we meet regularly, and we've developed a New Faculty Academy for all new faculty to help onboard them. It lasts for a year, it's once a month, we meet on Friday afternoons, and we talk. We talk the resources available to the faculty, to the students, community resources. Well, based on that, we expanded that new faculty academy to a new employee academy. All new employees now go through this. Uh, we kick it off with a, uh, with a retreat right before the start of an academic year. We, we have a really nice uh, place that we go for a retreat. At the pipe stimmer, we spend a couple of days, and we sit down with all new employees, and we vision. We talk about the mission of the college, the vision of the college, the values. We get to know each other. But then throughout the remainder of the year, once a month on Friday afternoons, we learn together how to make this a much more effective college. So when you ask me working with the others, I learned that by sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, working with the faculty, finding out their passions. So by me doing the same here, 
what are your passions? What are things that you would like to see accomplished, and how can we get there for you? Um, I mean, um, how do you typically engage and interact? Give us some specific examples of how you've engaged and interacted with community members. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You're the one that's following my references, right? No. No, okay. Well, that, that came up oh, I'm sorry. That, 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 that came up at the, at the board meeting downstairs. That uh, one person is right now you know, contacting my references and, and she pulled the community members. I was like, wow, all the stuff you've been doing. I've been very fortunate. Uh, the places I've worked, I've had some very supportive supervisors that allow me to be out in the community. As the president, I would obviously do the exact same thing. I, I've been privileged to be on a Chamber of Commerce boards, to chair committees of Chamber of Commerces, to be on economic development authorities, to be a president of two different Rotary Clubs, uh, to, to be active in the community, and also to volunteer at places like the Union Mission serving meals. Uh, it's important that the college is, and I've used this term downstairs, of the community, and that the president is of the community. Uh, the president is, is, is going to be the most visible leader at this college, there's no doubt about that, but it raises the profile of this college by not just the president being in the community, but all of the folks being in the community. Uh, the, the, the faculty, the staff, the administrators working with the community. So, so to me, you know, even though as a two-year college, most two-year colleges have the word community in there, I often say community is our middle name, whether it's in there or not. So I, I'm a very active member of the community. I, I think only by working with the community can I gain a greater understanding of what the needs are in the community, the challenges are, and how the college can partner with the community to be able to address those challenges. This one is similar to that, but how do you engage the community in order to get them on our campus, not necessarily as students, but yeah. in other ways? How do we get more engagement with the community on our campus? I think, and you're doing that tremendously, and I'd like to continue doing that. We open the college to the community, whether you have various events, um, yeah, yeah, I, I think you've got the uh, Hammerschmidt, is that correct? Am I saying that right? Hammerschmidt uh, lecture series. Having those opportunities to bring the community onto campus. I've had some privileges in working with the community and creating continuing education programs. Some of the continuing education programs are CEUs, so continuing education units that are required as professions, bring them onto campus. Some are simply leisure courses, whether we're talking cooking courses or art courses or, or genealogy courses bringing the community on the campus. Uh, where I am right now at Bluefield State, we, uh, the library reports directly to me. So we uh, partnered with one of the local merchants in town to open a coffee bar in, in, on campus. Uh, so you've got this coffee bar in the middle of campus to where the community's invited. We don't have any coffee bars in our community, uh, as strange as that may sound these days. So the community can come in and they can simply have coffee clutches and they can meet, they can talk. Uh, again, we need to be open to the community to do various events, but also some scheduled initiatives. Again, whether it's the continuing education classes, the leisure classes, any of those. So again, not only raise our profile in the community, but be open to the community to be able to come onto our campus, be a very active part of this college. Okay. And um, you answered this question in another form, but I wanted to bring it up again for the sake of some of the people that weren't there. Um, how, how have you gotten to know how the various grants work that we already have and maybe could have and about the resources these grants bring to the table? Sure. Yeah. My experience with grants first started as a faculty member. Uh, I, I mentioned the, the fact that I taught learning communities, I was the director of learning communities. That actually came about as a result of a nat national Endowment for Humanities, an NEH grant. Uh, I also had the privilege of helping secure not just that grant, but a Ford Foundation grant to be able to create initiatives for student engagement. As I became an administrator, I've worked very closely with the grants program, grants departments at colleges I've worked at. When I was at Mississippi State, we, we secured probably about $25 million, $26 million in local, state, and national grants many of which I actually managed under a PI system, a professional investigator system. Um, where I am right now, Bluefield State, the grants department reports directly to me. Uh, so we've secured in my last three years 
pretty close to $30 million in various grants, again, local, state, and national grants. Now, one thing, and I talked about this at the forum downstairs, is there anybody in this room that manages grants? Okay. Is there, well, that's your job is Title III, so maybe a little bit different. Is there any faculty members that manage grants? Okay. So you two made the exceptions on this, but downstairs when I asked how many people manage grants, several faculty members raised their hands. And I said, how many of you enjoy managing grants? And everybody lowered their hand. The reason why is, is because often a model for grants at many colleges, and North Ark's not different, is that a faculty member will go out and secure a grant. Great grant, great program, things I want to accomplish. Problem is, they become the grant manager, and that's something that often they don't want to do. What ends up happening is often we remove that faculty member from their classroom where they have the passion to teach and work with students, and remove them from the classroom to manage a grant taking them out of their area of expertise into an area, first of all, many of them do not enjoy, and secondly, they're out of the level of comfort there. We backfill that faculty member after we remove them from class with an adjunct or part-time faculty member who is probably not going to be nearly as effective in the classroom. So we've done a tremendous disservice by that. One thing we developed, both at Pellissippi State and at Bluefield State, when you get grants, you have administrative costs to grants. And generally those can go anywhere from maybe 10% up to, I've seen them high as 25%. That's the overhead that comes with the grant. We call it F&A, uh, Facilities and Administration. So let's say you get a million dollar grant. If you have a 17%, we're 17% by the way, Bluefield State, we get $170,000 to administer that grant. If we have several grants, I could easily use that million dollars we secure off of grants to be able to hire professional grants administrators. There are people that love to do that. I mean, I know you're doing it for Title III, Sarah, but there may be some other grants, too, that we have a professional administrator over those grants. We have a support staff that helps manage the grants, so that way it's not a one-person show. I hire professional grant writers. Now, one thing I, I don't do, I don't have the grant writers on college staff. The reason why is because we use freelance grant writers. So I may have five grant writers at any given time, and whoever's securing the most grants is probably going to end up getting more and more business from us on that. So it's kind of a hunger thing with many of those. So I think that's a very effective way to run grants. Uh, I'm not saying I would do that here. I want to hear from the folks that do grants, but from the very brief conversations I've had earlier today, I think there's a way that we can centralize a lot of those grants and be able to have a professional model so that faculty don't have to worry about implementing, administering, doing all of the paperwork that you have for grants and they can continue to enjoy the, the benefits that those grants provide. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> if we were to visit your campus, or former campus, what is the best thing about the, uh, the college and you that we would hear? Gosh, yeah. And this came up in the board meeting downstairs. <clears throat> there is a renewed energy and enthusiasm at our college. Uh, I was hired uh, about three years ago and uh, the president that hired me didn't have a strong relationship with the community, and, and unfortunately didn't have a strong relationship with the, the faculty and staff. She had lost a vote of no confidence uh, in uh, the community, and actually the city council had voted a resolution against her. So she was asked to resign by, by our trustees, and, uh, and I shared this, I think, at lunch today. You know, there's probably no more precarious position than a brand new vice president who's hired by somebody who just got fired. Uh, so all of a sudden, I'm in charge, and, and they made me the uh, acting president for the next three months. They already knew who they wanted as the president, and I have a wonderful working relationship with him. But together, in his last two and a half years and my last three years, there's been a real renewed enthusiasm at the college, and I'm so grateful for having that as well. We've created new programs. Those of you who've seen my CV, we've created two dozen new programs responding to community needs. We've created a very prescriptive pathway for students. So when students get to our college, they have a pathway to success. We now have every single student when they come to our college has to sign a, a student success contract. And in their contract it says, I will attend classes, I will not be late. If I, if I am late or can't attend, I will contact my instructor. So they all have a contract. They also have an individualized student success plan. And that student success plan, individual by individual, may be different 
uh, may say that you are going to spend so many hours a week in the tutoring center. Pretty much like we talked about the athletics today, Coach, that you've got two hours a week for your athletes. That may be part of that individualized student plan. Uh, individualized student plan, I agree not to work more than 20 hours a week outside of class. Those types of things. So we created that. We've increased student retention as a very good uh, result of that. About five months ago, six months ago, we acquired a hospital. Uh, and, and acquiring that hospital, we're in the process right now of moving all of our nursing and allied health programs into that hospital as a teaching facility. We're using the top two floors of that hospital as a dorm. That dorm opens in three weeks. So there's a lot of wonderful things happening at our college right now. And I think if you were to walk around and ask, you, you would hear people say that Ted Lewis is very much a part of, that my president has entrusted me to be the chair of almost every one of these initiatives that I just mentioned. Okay. This piggybacks that question, but what would we hear about you personally? About me personally? Mm -hmm. What would they say about you and what you're like to work with and sure. what you're like to work for? Yeah, yeah. And again, I, I know many of y'all are, are checking my references right now, so you'll know <laughs> firsthand. But I'm visible. You know, one thing you'll find out about me uh, is that I'm generally the first person on campus and one of the very last people to leave. I walk around. Yeah, we, we joke, Don and I were joking earlier today, that I believe in MBWA management by walking around because I, I, I like visitors. I like to be seen on campus because I think it's very important that the students know who's here, that the faculty members know who's here. So if you were to ask people on campus who Ted Lewis is, everyone would know. Uh, they would also say that I'm a firm believer in shared governance. Uh, I've, asked, I've been asked to oversee a lot of initiatives at the college, and when I do so, I create committees. Uh, now, I, I mentioned this at the board a while ago, I'm not a death by committee person because I think the committees need to be held accountable for their actions. But if there's an initiative, my president put me in charge of how we respond to COVID in my college. So I ask people, I want, I want you to be part of this team. And together we develop a very effective team that has responded to COVID in a very effective way. Uh, so I think if you were to ask people about me, they would say that I'm collegial, I'm collaborative, I'm visible. So those, those are some things I think you find about me. Okay. And hopefully a good sense of humor. <laughs> and I, I should have started with, with this one, but, um, and we've asked this one in all the rest of the forums, but why North Ark? Okay. And what, why did you choose to apply here? Why, yeah. why are you interested in us? Sure. Um, and and, and I, I apologize for those that have heard this at least three times today because <laughs> I think it's come up in each but no, no, uh, because I think it's important. Mm -hmm. yeah, I wasn't simply shopping resumes or looking for a job. I like where I am. I think uh, Bluefield State is a great college and we're accomplishing some great things. But a colleague of mine about three months ago contacted me and he'd worked in Arkansas and in a new higher ed in Arkansas. And he said, Ted, there's a position up at North Arkansas College, North Ark, that you should probably look at. I, I think given your experience, given your passions, this may be a position that might suit you very well. So I spent some time, I, I, I looked at your website. I looked at your strategic plan. I read your financial report, your annual financial report. And I, I come to a realization that, that I know you guys already know, is, is that this is a very good college. This is a very strong college with a good national reputation. You've got a strategic plan that is a very realistic strategic plan, one that meets your goals and one that are manageable goals. It starts with student success. Well, I told you that's my vision to begin with, but you've got student success. You've got engagement. You've got student access. You've also got excellent programs. Those are the things that you measure. And those are the things that you value. Well, again, those are things I value. Looking at your annual financial report, you're well positioned financially. You can't say that about a lot of colleges across this country, but you, North Ark, are well positioned financially to meet the needs of your students and of your community. Speaking of meeting community needs, you've got two great campuses. And I read about that, but today I got to tour both those campuses. Uh, your, your North Campus, your South Campus, that you're meeting the regional and the workforce needs of your community. You also have a workforce center I didn't have a chance to see uh, with, Finuc, with Finuc training. Um, the most important thing for me is that you invest. You make strong investments. First, you invest in your students. You've got over 50 programs 
that are workforce-based programs, career technical programs, programs that articulate four-year institutions. There's a very good balance there of those programs to serve student needs. You also have a very good outreach program to your high schools, your early college initiatives, uh, your, your dual enrollment programs, concurrent enrollment programs, you call them, that you're working with 18 different high schools right now. And in doing so, you're offering classes for those students to be successful in. You heard me tell my story a while ago as a first generation student. Well, those college classes while those students are in high school, that's very important for those first generation students because so many of them don't have college on their radar. They've never thought about college before. Well, by having a concurrent enrollment class for those students, now it puts it on their radar and it demonstrates to them that they can be successful. If I can be a successful college student, I can complete college. That's a game changer, folks. That is huge in changing the expectations of these high school students. Not only that, but it creates momentum for those students. The hours that they complete in high school, they can come here and maybe one more semester, two more semesters, they can be college graduates. You also have great articulation programs at four-year institutions. Those students that aren't taking workforce or career tech programs straight into the workforce, they can articulate onto a four-year without losing any hours whatsoever. You have great resources for your students. Your advising resources, your tutoring resources, um, specialized populations, your trio center, the veteran services, the disability services, you invest in that student success. You've got very strong online presence for those students as well. Now, we know that students are successful because they academically integrate into the institution. But they're also successful because they socially integrate into the institution. We know that the longer a student stays on campus, even outside class, the more likely they are to be successful. Now, Coach, you, you've got four outstanding athletic teams, but one of the things that really impressed me about you today is you were saying you've got these academic All-Americans. And the reason why is because students who might not otherwise come to college are here because they want to play basketball. But at the same time, they are successful academically as well. You've got over a dozen student organizations, very active SGA, at least pre-COVID you did, uh, a reason for students to stay here, to stay engaged. You have activities and events for students, whether we're talking about intramurals. Uh, is anybody here from the North Campus? Got a great tour today. Scott gave me a great tour, Scott and Bill both, of the North Campus and seeing how the students even installed their own equipment onto that campus. And they're very active in Skills USA. So again, things that integrate the students socially onto campus as well. You also invest in your employees. You've got a great employee assistance program. Employees that want to go on and earn their degrees or advanced degrees, you've got the resources and the support and wraparound services to help them do that. You've got good faculty professional development programs, you've got great staff development programs. So you invest in your employees. You also invest in your community. Uh, you open this campus to the community, various events on campus. I already said the, the Hammerschmidt Lecture Series inviting the community on the campus. Your adult education, people who don't have that high school diploma, you've got an adult education program to be able to help them get that high school equivalency. You've got continuing education programs for the community, once again. That may be CEUs, it may be leisure studies, but you open the college to the community. And then finally, the investment the community makes in you. You've got an outstanding board of trustees. I've read about them. I had a wonderful opportunity to meet them earlier today. You've got community leaders that are invested in the success of this college and that take the time to help this college be successful. <clears throat> successful. You also have a great foundation. Your foundation has raised money for over 80 student scholarships to be able to help students get, their, get the college degree and achieve their dream of a successful career upon graduation. All of those are signs from an outstanding college and one I'd be honored to work for. about one minute. Do you have any questions for us? Uh, <laughs> I, I could throw a question out, but then ask for everybody to answer. Is, is there anything else I can answer, though? How about hobbies? What are you doing your leisure time? Yeah, so, yeah, it, it's interesting. My wife and I love to be outside. We love to hike. Uh, and, and being up here reminded us that when we first got married, we spent time up here. We lived in Fort Worth at the time. And we would come up here in the fall because Fort Worth didn't have fall. 
uh, and, and we go along the Buffalo River. So we would love to hike. We, we hiked in Tennessee and West Virginia. The challenge is we've got two very young children. Uh, our oldest is five and our youngest just turned four just about a month ago. So my hobby now rather than hiking is studying at playgrounds and playing swing with my, my boys. Um, also like the garden, although really when you get down to it, Catherine likes to garden. I just simply move the dirt from bed to bed for her to garden. So I, I like doing that. I like being outside. Um, that's it. And, and spending time with my family, obviously. And I know you have a connection. Yes. A slight connection yes. with Harrison. Yes. To tell everybody about that. Absolutely. So, so Catherine's mother was born here. Um, her grandfather, and of course I never knew her, her grandfather or grandmother, uh, Charles Jones is your grandfather, and, and he was born here. Uh, her mother, Mildred Jones, was born here. They moved to Topeka. Was it Topeka that they moved to? Osage, sorry, Osage. Uh, not long after she was born. So Kevin and I have come up here to kind of do genealogical research, to kind of understand the community. So absolutely. Her grandmother um, was named May Lamb, I believe. So I don't know if anybody knows any Lambs or Joneses around here, but they may very well be related to Catherine. So yes. Well, that, is, that takes up all of our time. I'm okay. sure you're probably exhausted. It's been a great day. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.